Good morning, everybody. So my presentation is entitled Surfing the Tsunami. And Shirley's taught me the value of working with images. At the beginning of the project, she asked for an image. Um, and the image I gave at that time was of driving the car and changing the wheel at the same time. And that was reflective of the type of chaos that I felt. Um, and three years down the line, I think things have advanced sufficiently that there's still a lot of chaos around me, but I'm surfing the current now. And so, um, you've got to be careful. There's a lot of balancing, Uta mentioned the balancing, there's a lot of balancing that you need to do. And so I thought that was a, an appropriate image for my presentation. So in terms of what I'm going to cover, um, I should actually say the team, because I'm not going to go into the specifics of the individuals, you know, people have come and gone. Um, and then we will, of course, talk about the transition to comfort um, and some of the lessons that we've learned over there. And then touch a bit on the challenges, what we've learned. Um, you know, one can't really do justice in such a short space of time, but then move on to what now and some institutional recommendations. Okay. So the issue in our department is that um, practically every person that's come in has had to hit the ground sprinting. Um, and if you hit the ground sprinting, you don't have much time to reflect. And part of the tsunami around me is the massive student growth, especially after 2010. Mm -hmm. And so there was this imperative around we need to grow. Um, and you know, if you're dealing with large student numbers, a small team, you don't have the time to reflect. What we sought to do as a department, um, we wanted to open ourselves up to scrutiny. And we wanted to think deeply about what we were doing. So we became part of this DLL project to do that. Um, we also allowed uh, Dr. Sheridan Clarence, who was the former director of the writing center, to come into our class as part of the PhD studies and observe us in the lectures and give us feedback on that. Um, Juliet from the SEAT team gently convinced me, which was a wonderful thing, about the benefits of being one of the pioneers for ECAMFA. And that was great, but those are three of the things where we said, yeah, we want to avail ourselves because we want to enhance that student approach and we want to, to think deeply. So for us, it may not be that all of my team was involved with DLL, but through the engagement with me, we were able to think very deeply about what we were doing, and we were able to reflect not only on our operations, but around the choices that we were making. <coughs> so then just some background. You know, we always call ourselves a small department, and we're always referred to as a small department. Um, and at times, I feel a bit like the Pan-African Congress in Parliament. Um, because you've got to be on every committee, you've got to service every relationship, you've got to deal with every stakeholder, you've got to know every process and every policy. But you still have to do the core business that you have to do. But actually, small department is on the criteria of number of staff. And when I arrived in 2010, we had four posts not four people, four posts. And how you work around those four posts can be quite innovative. But we're not a small department. We're a big department. We're a big department in terms of our student numbers. We had phenomenal student growth. And so um, in 2012, for example, we had to do what's called block teaching. And that relates to the fact that there's the, the venue with the highest capacity on campus is 350. And so because we are part of, um, we are offered in the law faculty at first year level, we're part of the B-admin degree, compulsory to the second year, 
be part of the BA program, but that is um, the choice of the student. And then the BCom four year can also do it. So at first year level, there's this high demand because often people want to use it as a filler course. Um, and we had to do this block teaching and you had this tremendous growth. What we do now is we cap to 400, which is it's about 350 to the biggest venue and then our after hours offering. Um, that's first year level. Second year level, you're looking around about 200. Third year is 150. It might be more, it might be less. And postgrad, when I arrived, we had about 13 postgrad students. We've now got 50, which is because we've introduced the structured masters. So you've got your honors, your masters, your PhD, your undergrad across various faculties, and then you've got the after hours program. So we're not small. Um, in terms of student numbers, and often I get this quip from colleagues, oh, but you can manage things because you only have a small team. Not so. In fact, that small team has to cohere, and I'll come to that, um, because we've got to work smart to deal with the high student numbers. Then just very quickly, in terms of our sub-disciplines, we've got four, which is political theory, international relations, South African politics, Comparative politics, and we've got a very strong uh, methodological focus. And then we have a commitment to continuously looking at our teaching and learning practice, as well as our supervision practice. And as I say, that was the reason that we availed ourselves as a department to strive to improve that. Okay. So, my title, a dynamic team of people. As I say, some have come, some have gone. Um, but you know what's really important for me is the fact that, yes, the curriculum is critical, and we reflect deeply on that. Yes, the mode of delivery is critical, and we reflect on that. But ultimate for me is the mindset, not only the mindset of the individuals, but the mindset of the team. And the kind of things that were spoken about earlier, around a common understanding. Um, and I'm very fortunate, as I say, that's not all members of the team over there, but as a small team, you know, I often say we operate like a family business, which means you've got to pull up your sleeves and you've got to put the work in. Um, and we cohere really well as a team. And, you know, we are very different people with divergent opinions, but there's a high level of trust. And that for me has been really, really important. So when I came in into this tsunami, um, the critical priorities was around improving systems. Uh, Uta again spoke about the need for good systems. Um, improving our offerings, but then also raising the profile of the department. Because let's say we improve our offerings, but we're not perceived in a very good way. How does that help the student who's then got to compete as historically you're competing against UCT, Stellenbosch, and there are all these misperceptions around uh, the image of the university. So I would say that we've accomplished that transformation in terms of our systems, in terms of our offerings, um, in terms of our profile, and it's through having staff members who are present, who are adaptable, who are willing to reflect with me. Okay, so the transition to Ecomfa. As I say, Juliet gently convinced me, um, which I'm very grateful for doing that. And we had to work really closely with the team. We were one of the pioneer departments. Um, and we had to have many, many meetings with them and they gave a lot of their time and they worked through the entire process with us. And I'm happy to say that in the faculty there's a significant uptake now. Practically all the departments are using not only Ecomfa but other innovations and it's really very hard me to see that level of uptake. Uh, we did learn some lessons and this has been mentioned before. So the issue around site construction, it's not a quick fix, okay? It's a labor intensive process and there's a need for uh, continuous review. And if the students are the benefit, 
then the course needs to be, the site needs to populate, be populated, it needs to be interactive. Um, and what we especially learned is, you know, with Juliet's team, is the fact that you need to know what you want to achieve from the course. And the site features follow. It's not the other way around. Um, and that is a very important thing. And then around uh, the personal interaction, which is something, again, which has been mentioned before. Um, but the innovations, I mean, ICAMFA, I've told the people in the faculty, it's like having a Porsche in your garage. And if you only, if you only use very select features, like to make announcements, or upload material, it's like you just switch it on, and then you get into your Foxy, and then off you go. Um, and it's really a powerful tool. We're very happy with it. But it supplements rather than replaces personal interaction. And this is especially so in a discipline like political studies, where we're trying to foster critical engagement. And a lot of that comes through interaction, through debate, maybe through simulation exercises, et cetera. OK. So I, I can't really call it future plans. Um, because even though we've surfed the wave and we're surfing the wave, it's a delicate balancing act and we by no means have arrived. Um, and so I put there perfecting the basics because you need to have a good, strong, solid basic framework and work from there. And that as well is a continuous process. We need to continue with deepening the quality of our offerings. Um, and Professor will talk a bit more, a little bit more about the P-admin degree. But that is actually, to me, a very critical component. Um, and we've been in consultation with Prof Tapscott from the School of Government. Um, you know, it's one of the degrees where we are compulsory to the second year level. And then you've got public administration, which is compulsory. Um, but the big driver for me is, you know, the national development <coughs> plan says to us that we need to develop this professional, committed, competent core of public service, um, people in the public service sector. And how do we speak to that plan? And what are we offering, etc.? cetera? Um, and so if we really look at the degree, it's an issue of saying, what are we teaching? Um, speaking to people in, for example, the African local government sector, speaking to the CETAs, looking at issues around work, um, workplace learning, workplace um, training, etc. But that is not a tiny conversation. It is a complex conversation which we've been having, um, but it's, it's, there's a very, very long way to go in terms of that conversation. And you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, and that's just my, my image, the government full of empty promises. I think it's very important given what many would argue is a crisis <coughs> at local government level. This is something important that we need to think about. Now, uh, Sally was much better than me in terms of being tech savvy, um, because I also have a, a um, yeah, I'll be fine. Yeah. I also have an interview, but Sally was so tech savvy she embedded it. <laughs> And I was the cautious one that said, now I'm downloading this thing and I'm bringing it. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a video of Samantha Castle, who is the manager in our alumni office. And she's currently doing her master's with us. But she came via the, um, the after hours program. No, I'll do it at home. Flown in from London. Mm. At great cost. Finish Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Samantha Koss, I'm okay, wait, 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 the Relations Manager at the University of Western Cape. I've continued my journey uh, with uh, educational development uh, from, uh, you know, since I've started with my first diploma. 
So I ended up um, doing all of the short courses and then decided that you know, I needed a, uh, a degree. And uh, that's why as an older student, I went back to the university and I pursued a degree. And now pursuing a master's in international relations. The wonderful thing about being a part-time student is um, you, know, you end up being a little bit more mature and experienced. And what surprised me was when I walked into the class and I actually was the youngest in the class of part-time students. So in the class were uh, you know, moms and dads with family. And I think that was the inspiration for me. That I, in all of this, despite all my challenges, you know, mine is only so much in comparison to actual moms and dads that are having to sacrifice their time to complete their degree. Some of the biggest challenges as a part-time student um, is management of time. And I think um, from an institution's point of view, what needs to be considered is how flexible learning can be made um, to accommodate those kinds of needs, so particularly if uh, we can get classes to start, I don't know, a little later or a lot more stuff can be done online that allows people to interact to, and also to complete their degrees, um, doing it in line with all the other commitments that they have. Okay, so that was Samantha Castle. <coughs> She's one of our master students, as I said. So if I can then just move to Oh, that's Sam. Oh, no. I don't have the... Oh, there we go. Okay. So if I can then just quickly move to some of the recommendations. Um, and, you know, I understand that some of these recommendations relate to ongoing issues and in actual fact, there are attempts to deal with it. It's just a matter of highlighting them again. Um, in terms of ECOMFA, and this is something that I've, I've communicated with the team, and they are as well looking at it, is around, it's a tiny thing. It's around the electronic sign up of tutorials. Um, it's part of the functionality. Uh, so that's one of the things, you know, stuff like, for example, embedding, turn it in, um, in the system, those kind of things. Then the broader, more institutional recommendations is around infrastructure. Um, and there it's this lag between the growth of the student population and our current infrastructure, in particular teaching <coughs> infrastructure. So yes, there is an awareness, yes, there is upgrades happening, yes, there's new buildings that's maybe happening, um, but if you've got your largest teaching venue at 350 capacity, this presents a significant challenge, not only for teaching and learning, but the strain that it puts on departments. So when you start to then have to either cap your course to a certain number, or you've got to teach in blocks, um, it really puts quite a strain. And so I think what we need to, as an institution, is to try to look at our infrastructure plan and say how do we bridge that lag or that gap between student growth and infrastructure. Um, and then the other one which is related to that is around the systems. So around, for example, registration and timetabling. Um, and that actually relates back to venue capacity. So if, for example, you have students, so in our case you've got law students who do our first year course as an elective, they regard it as a so-called terminal course, terminating course. You can't do it to second or third year level. They decide to register early because they're enthusiastic, right? And now you've got a venue capacity of 350 and they register early. They then effectively can bump out students for whom this course is compulsory. So what do I then say about a contractual obligation? The book says it's compuls it is compulsory. I've got to register the extra people, which then means I've got to move to a second block of teaching. So those kind of um, almost system level issues around ICT, registration, timetabling, but which links back to venue capacity. And then the third recommendation 
um, which I'm not really touched on um, in my presentation, but which is just so important in terms of teaching and learning and in terms of the reflections that's come out is around the tutorial system. Um, and I just feel that it's a very unrecognized layer and um, yes, there have been attempts, there's been investments um, in this, but oftentimes when uh, funds are drying up or my, if money is tight, the tutorial system suffers. Um, and I would say that is something that we really need to look at and not let it suffer. And we need to give recognition to the role played um, in the academic project um, all the tutors, and we need to pay more attention to that. Um, so those are my big, I mean there's many, under each slide one can talk at length. I'd just like to conclude though by saying that um, I'd like to thank the DLL team, in particular Shirley, I mean if you saw that image of me under the microscope, that is me under the microscope, <laughs> um, but it wasn't painful. Um, it was really beneficial uh, to be part of the project and then to say to Sakwa as well for the funding and the support that I'm really appreciative because ultimately it was students um, who were the beneficiaries of this project. So I just wanted to say a big thank you for that. Thank you.